Hi, this is Doug Hoekster from True Tone Recording Studios in Nashville, and you're listening to John Broughton on Retrospectives 3SER KC Radio. Okay, well, firstly, congratulations on the new record. Would this be the record you're most proud of to date? Well, um, yeah. I mean, you know, I think it's standard fare for, for artists always to say that. Like, nobody wants to say, gee, I made a really bad record and the <laughs> one before it was better. <laughs> but, um, I, I, I mean, truthfully, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with it. I, I think it, um, I think, I guess it's like anything, one of the things that, that makes um, things more challenging in terms of making a record is, is consistency. Um, just trying to get everything uh, like a consistently strong top to bottom set of songs and also arrangements and performances and everything because you have so many variables. And so, you know, I, I feel like I, I did that and so I feel pretty happy with it. You know, I'm able to listen to it straight through and be pretty pleased that it came out it came out the way uh, we intended. Yeah, I read you quoted as saying this is one record of yours that you can actually sit down and listen to from start to finish. Are you a harsh judge of your own work usually? Oh, definitely. I mean, I, and I think it's I think it's a slightly different paradigm when you're in the. Um, I don't know if it's good or bad, but you know when when you're independent, you know, in the independent music scene, I guess, or when you're not like a. Um, you know, when you're not the Beatles or whatever, you do have limits in terms of people's availability and, and budgets and time constraints. And so I think because of that, it always seems like often you'll get into a record where there'll be a really, like, you know, if it's, if it's a really strong song, uh, typically, that I, that I really feel good about, maybe I'll recut it, you know, if it doesn't come out quite right. But I don't have the luxury of doing, like, you know, whatever, 10 different, colors of a certain song, you know, to mm. see which one is going to be appropriate, or record a song with three or four different sets of players to see which one is the best. So, you know, most artists, I think, don't have that luxury. And so because of that, a lot of times when you get through a record, there's things that, that kind of click the way you wanted them to, but then other things that you wish if you just had a little more time or a little more resources or whatever, you could shape it slightly differently. But on this record, again, you know, I feel pretty good about where we came out. I've had a few listens to it now, and I think of all your records, this would probably be the one that's more instantly accessible to people who aren't particularly familiar with your work. Would would that be a fair comment? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think, um, yeah, I think so. I think um, there was a lot of thought put in between me and the producer, David Henry, in terms of getting a, a nice range of... of um, styles and everything in there to make it interesting top to bottom. I mean, I try to do that anyway, but but we worked on that. And I also tried to write some of the songs, you know, I mean, I do a lot of narrative songs and some of the some of the songs are straight narratives, but I also tried to write a little bit differently in some cases and do some things that are a little more associative or imagistic and 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 so I tried to mix it up that way and I think all those things together, yeah, probably makes it a little more accessible. If you could label any kind of theme to to the album, what, what what do you think it would be? Well, you know, that's funny because I never think about that, but it always seems to kind of coalesce. And I think, you know, I, I've said this, I guess, in interviews before, but when I stand back from stuff and, 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 and look at my stuff over time, I mean, I think I write a lot about... about um, people, you know, connections, misconnections, or, or people struggling to make connections, or, you know, people who are slightly disenfranchised and, and in those areas. And so I think these songs have those kind of themes again. And, and you know, once I have those kind of themes, then musically I, I try to mix it up to, to match them. So I don't know. I guess I guess that would still be, you know, the sort of a... a that whole thing it's all about the human condition and and people um people trying to be part of a greater um existence i think so i mean all the key songs like bloom and roses and and kevin geist and subway train those are all about the songs all about songs some people somehow being separate and then coming together or trying to come together and i don't do that consciously i, I guess subconsciously that's just what i find um interesting uh, it's been or a worth talking about. 
Yeah, it's been a few years since the last album of new studio material. Were all these songs uh, written in that time frame since then? Yeah, I mean, some were written... Uh, yeah, I mean, I tend to write in verse, so I guess some of them were probably written, you know, a, a couple years back, and some of them were written probably right around the time I started recording last year. So, um, you know, I, I did do an EP along the way, and uh, so there, there was a little bit of new new material that had come out between this and the waiting CD, but um, most of this stuff was hanging around. Pardon me? No, you're fine. Continue. No, I... I Okay, so, um, yeah, so, I mean, there was, uh, you know, this just written over time, and then, but some of the stuff, sometimes when you get in a recording process, um, I think it spurs you on, and, and this is one of the things uh, on a tangent, you know, everybody talks about how single song downloads are bringing back um, the idea of, you know, the single, and I guess that's okay, but I kind of like, one of the things I like about the album structure is often you'll get like eight, maybe eight, nine songs into a record, and you'll look at the whole entity of it, and you'll say, ah, well, maybe we need something a little more up-tempo here, or maybe we need something that's in a, in a, in a different time signature here, or whatever. And so there's always a couple songs that come together, I think, at the end of a project, and sometimes those are the most interesting songs. So even though the songs were written over time, as we got into the project, yeah, some of the stuff came up uh, newer, just, just to sort of complete it. Do you pay as much attention to, to the sequencing of an album now as perhaps you would have in the past, in, the, in these days of people downloading individual tracks? Is it as important? Yeah, I think I'll always think of it. I mean, I grew up on, on my brother's old old vinyl and then you know records and cds and stuff so i mean i always think in terms of the entity i always think of it as sort of like you know inhabiting a world between maybe music and stories and and the way that like you know the beatles and dylan and springsteen and all those people have done it and so i always think in those terms and i always put a lot of uh attention into sequencing and and a lot of times you know this is probably really um detrimental actually but i don't really think in terms of the standard thing of like oh i'm going to put the, the big grabber uh up front you know um i mean i try to think in terms of trying to get a thing that builds a little bit and that's also kind of balanced uh so you know i mean and sometimes I, you can see where that in our in our world of so much product it's funny it's almost like i can read a review and i can tell if the guy focuses on like the first two songs, <laughs> even if it's a good review, I don't know if he made it, you know, or if he made it with the same intensity all the way through the record. If somebody talks about the back end of the record, I know they're a little much of a clo more of a close listener. <laughs> now, it's probably so. um, as wide a array of instrumentation on on this record as you've ever had before. Was that a feature you really were conscious of achieving this time around? You got everything on there from in, a, in terms of. Oh, in terms of instruments, you've got everything on there from a ukulele to a, a toy piano. It's a, a wide array of, uh, of uh, instruments. Yeah, it's funny because I always think in terms of like the studio being a, a slightly different um, paradigm than live performing. I never think in terms of, oh, I need to recreate this live. So yeah, I mean, it's like you get the song and I think you just kind of think, well, what does this song need? And somehow... I think from years of listening to music and playing music, there's certain answers that are immediately implied, and then you go for it. And I think one of the great advantages of being in Nashville is there are so many good players in so many arenas. So if you come up with an idea like that, and like you or the engineer or the people at hand can't do it, well, you just go and there's a slew of people you can pull in. So yeah, I think I, I love to make advantage of that. And it's funny, even though I'm like a singer-songwriter, um, and I mean, I always think of bands like, you know, again, the Beatles or the Kinks or people who made these records that kind of have different um, textures, you know, because I think those records, hold, you know, they hold up more over time. And so, that's, yeah, that is what I try to do. Tell us about uh, some of the players on the album and, uh, and their backgrounds. Well, I mean, there's some people that I've, I, you know, there's a mix of people that I've worked with in the past and a mix of people that um, uh, the producer, David Henry, brought in, and he plays on it a lot. So, I mean, you've got this rhythm section of Paul Griffith and Paul Slivka, and they play on a lot of stuff around town. And 
um, and records that you've probably heard, John Prine, Elizabeth Cook, and different people like that. And they're really good. So they were like the core um, rhythm section. And then I had a couple really good guitar players, um, Joe Rathbone, who's also a singer-songwriter in his own right, who's quite good. And then my pal, George Marinelli, who's worked, I've worked with a lot in the past. And George plays with Bonnie Raitt, typically, and he was one of the founding members of Bruce Hornsby's band. So, but he was on the road a lot, so I didn't use him as much as normal. And then there's a variety of people. Um, Bobby Bear Jr., who I'm sure you know about, who yeah. sang on a track. And um, uh, I, that was the first I'd met him. John Diedrich, who um, plays with Patty Griffin and some other cool people, played some keys. And uh, Barry Walsh played keys. He's a friend of mine. He plays with Gretchen Peters and the Box Tops and a bunch of people. So... You know, I mean, that's in Asheville. Oh, and uh, Nerva, Nerva, too, who's sung with me in the past, Nerva um, Doris St. Reddy. I mean, she's terrific, and she's a former Fisk Jubilee singer who now sings with a sort of a, uh, I guess you'd call it a Christian hip-hop band called Toby Mac. It's pretty big. So, I mean, really, a lot of, a lot of people from a lot of different, um, you know, areas mm. and, and, you know, that's great. And then we did the track in, um, in Norway. Norway, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In addition to everything that was done in Nashville, I, I, on my first tour of Norway, um, I met some guys who played with Thomas Dybdahl, and uh, they sat in with me on some gigs and then offered to record a track. And so I wasn't sure what we'd get out of that, but it it, it worked out really well. And that's the uh, the closing track on the album, Everywhere Somewhere. So yeah, so really people from all over the place. Talk about some of the uh, some of the songs on the album. Um, the significance of the uh, um, the Napa Vegas Scrabble Club. Tell us about that one. <laughs> well, that that's kind of about my hometown. That's uh, I li- I came from a place called Naperville, uh, which is I grew up in, which is a little. It was a little uh, farming town when I was a kid. And it's near Chicago, and it, it grew into this really nasty, high scale, upper crust kind of suburb. And so, like you know. We joke and we call it Napier Vegas because it's just this terrible urban sprawl now. And so I thought it would be kind of fun just to kind of like, you know, have a little fun with that. And and that song was supposed to be like a like a like kind of like a mid period kink song, you know, one of those songs. Because you know, I'm all, I was always thought it was cool how Ray Davies did all these things that were spins on his community and his his home and and growing up like the Village Green and everything. Yeah at a time when it wasn't fashionable to do that at all. And so I thought it would kind of be like my little version of that. <laughs> so that was kind of a... It's funny because my folks swear that song is about them. And and I tell them, no, it's not really about you. It's just about the community. But, you know, I, I don't think they quite believe me on that. <laughs> so. And uh, Gavin Geist, I believe, uh, about an old school friend of yours. Yeah, and that was based on a... a fella I actually knew who um so I don't know should I give the punchline here yeah go <laughs> ahead before yeah. you play the song okay well I mean it, it, it was a true story in the sense that there's this guy I went to school with who um he was kind of like you know he was a misfit and he didn't fit in and kids picked on him a lot and uh I, I remember him from school but then um uh later I didn't go to my class reunion but a friend of mine did and I found out that he had had a sex change and uh, he's now a woman and uh, hopefully maybe he's in a better place in terms of being I guess self-actualized or whatever that means Um, and so I thought it would I thought he'd be an interesting guy to write about and and the reason I really wanted to write about him though was I remember not too long ago I was over in England on a tour and on all the buses they had all these um, videos, these anti-bullying things and you know I think there's more of a focus in schools nowadays to uh, to deal with that and, and it really is a tough part of growing up for a lot of people and it seems to me that this is, in his case it was a, he obviously went through a very obvious physical and, and whatever emotional transformation, yeah. you know, becoming an adult, but but for a lot of kids, I mean, that's what grown-ups hard, and uh, it's hard for kids who don't fit in, and it's hard for kids who get bullied, and I think everybody, that song always gets a, a lot of response when I play it live, and particularly the line, um, Lord of the Flies Every Day, 
Because, mm-hmm. you know, it really is tough in, in school for a lot, of, a lot of people. Most people, I think. So anyway, I, I felt that was a good way to kind of deal with, through him to kind of deal with that topic. Do you um, know if, if he's aware of the song? No, I don't. I, you know, I, no, I haven't, I haven't tried to locate him or anything, but, uh, so I have no idea. But, <laughs> um, it's funny, I will tell you that most of the time people get it live, but sometimes if I'm at, in a very uh, not astute audience, I, I get to the end and I'm not sure if they quite understand what went down. <laughs> but, you know, hey, you got to take chances, you know? Yeah, look, I'll have to confess I missed it the first time, but I got it the second time. <laughs> <laughs> it's subtle, it's subtle, you know. And the title track, Blooming Roses, is also a true story, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I was doing some um, canvassing for the election, the last election, trying to register voters and uh, doing some volunteer work for, for John Kerry, but for the Democratic Party, just kind of re- trying to register people, really. And um, and I was going through the projects in Nashville and uh, uh, going door to door, and it's, it's the kind of place where you, most people just don't even walk into it. It's a, kind of a closed neighborhood. And... Um, so I um, I uh, met this woman on a porch, and we just had a conversation about our kids. Really, she had a she had a baby, and and she was rocking the baby. And we talked about our kids, and you know, it, it was just kind of like this these disparate worlds. And and the thing that we could immediately connect on was was our children. And and I thought about you know that's one of the interesting things about being a dad. You know, my son is five and a half now, and. I think it's interesting in the way that it brings you into like the community in a way nothing else does, you know, because mm. I think people can instantly connect over that. So that's what that song's about. And it's also about, you know, in the midst of all this chaos, it can be the project. There's always hope, you know, and there's always obviously the bloom and roses or the, the, uh, you know, the metaphor for that, but there, there is. And a lot of those people, they do, You'd be amazed how how much care they put into their little uh, into the gardens that that line the walks. They've got this little patch of land in one of the most high crime areas in the city, and yet they're working on that garden. Yeah. So I think that was interesting too. Just going back to your book, bothering the coffee drinkers, which was a fantastic read. When you're working on material like that, can songwriting take a, a bit of a backseat when when you're focusing on on your prose material? Well, yeah, I mean, with that book, it was short stories, so they were written over time, and um, and so therefore, you know, they wouldn't take me away for too much. I mean, they, you know, some, it's like anything. Sometimes you'll get you'll be working on a song and you'll hit a dead end. You have to, you have to put it away for a while, and go to another song, or in this case, go to a story, and vice versa. So, didn't have too much of that. I, I am trying to write a novel though, and that's a little different dynamic. I think that takes more of a day in day out commitment and uh i started it before the cd came out and i was writing every day and and it was it was difficult to do much more because you it, it's a different kind of mental exercise so um i'm, I'm finding it a little little more difficult to do that it, it, but with the short stories you know it was just kind of like um easy to uh easy to juggle i guess I believe you've been doing uh, some spoken word readings at, at some of your shows too. Yeah, I've been and I've been doing it. You know, it's funny. I did some like bookstore kind of gigs when the book came out, but then I started doing it um, in my set, and I felt kind of weird about it because I didn't want to be pretentious or anything like that. But I just I'd flat out ask the audience, and they'd always ask for it, and they always seemed to enjoy it too. And I think I think particularly when you're playing solo, you know. You gotta try to. Uh, you gotta. You have to use every trick at your disposal. You know. You blow a little harmonica. You play different, different rhythms. You kind of tell a little few stories. You know. And then if I have this in the middle of the set, I think it. I think it helps. Uh, it helps kind of complete the show in a lot of ways. And and I think it. I think the book reflects on the music, uh, as the music reflects kind of on the experiences in the book. I think somehow they're like parallel tracks, and I think people get that. Yeah. Can it depend though on the on the type of venue that you're you're playing at, where, how the spoken word material is received? Oh yeah, yeah, certainly. But you know, when I'm playing solo, I'm generally in a sympathetic area. I mean, we've done a funny thing when I've had the band sometimes. Uh, 
they'll play like cocktail jazz behind me or like beat jazz and then I'll read over that and that's pretty funny oh, yeah. and, you know yeah, yeah. so that that's kind of camp but we kind of like to do that and, and that's kind of fun too you know they'll just ad lib so it's pretty cool <laughs> I saw a quote describing you as Americana's answer to Oscar Wilde how, how did that sit with you when you saw that well, you know, I, I do kind of a running joke in my in my set about that. That's a high compliment on one hand, but it is like completely unmarketable on the other. <laughs> so I have to laugh because when you get praise like that, or my uh, the other one I always mention is uh, somebody in Belgium said, uh, "Godfather of narrative, alternative folk." <laughs> and so I tell my uh, tell my audiences, yeah, somehow I don't see the kids trying to figure out whether they're going to go see. Uh, Hold steady, modest mouse, or the godfather of narrative alternative folk, you know. <laughs> but you know, there it's well-meaning and it's uh, it's positive, and and you know, I think every, you know, I think I've been lucky to get nice nice media coverage, and you know, generally people really dig into it, and I think the people, uh, particularly in press and radio, who who support me, stay with it uh, from CD to CD. So you know, I, I'm very fortunate. So. You know that's all good. Now you've been on the uh, on the promotional trail with this CD. How's the response been today? Has has it opened up any new areas for you? Well, yeah. I mean, it's been good, and it's been like I think everything builds on the thing before. So, you know, you just try to facilitate as many new opportunities as you can. I mean, since the CD came out, I've been doing stuff in the states mostly, and it's funny because you know I've been traveling a lot in Europe over the last few years and so this is you know I haven't I haven't really focused on the states too much in in I don't know 4 years maybe mm-hmm. and so I'm kind of like going back to markets in the Midwest and and south and east coast and and trying to reconnect with all that and so that's been good um the, the CD will be out in England and Europe later in the year on a British label and so I'll go back over to England and Netherlands and all that and you know, things are popping up all the time as I go, but, you know, I'll probably know more by, I don't know, the end of the year where it all takes me. Yeah. You know, hopefully it takes, take, you know, I mean, my goal, you know, I try to keep it simple, which is my goal is to make a better record each time and then, um, you know, get in new places and get enough, you know, do well enough to make another cool record. So, you know, that's, that's kind of how I look at it, you know, just trying to build on the thing before. So how how soon after a new record release do you start thinking about the next one? I mean, for example, you're already writing for for the next record. Yeah, well, I think about it immediately because I love the recording process and I love the excitement of um, uh, of of finishing it and getting it out. And I think, like a lot of people, you suffer a little postpartum because you know, in, again, unless you're like, uh, you know, whatever. Radiohead or the Beatles or somebody with a coordinated campaign, it, sometimes it takes a little time for it to get to get moving, and so you know you want everything to happen immediately and all this, and you just have to be patient and let it unfold. But I mean, ideologically, I'm ready instantly. But at the same time, I realize, well, you know, it, it's more of a process in, in these days. And and again, even major artists are unlikely to put out records what more than what every other year. Yeah. I mean, back in back in the day, what Dylan and those guys, they were all doing like Stones and Beatles who were doing what three 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 records a year. That's right. At least. But they had a they had a different market and a different audience. And not only are sales not as in, as um intense as they were then, but I think media is so comprehensive it takes longer even for major artists to uh to tap it all out, you know? So I think you just gotta you know you got to know that that's that's what you're going, but yeah, I, I mean, from from a creative viewpoint, I'm ready to go all the time, you know. Uh, but you just have to be patient, and sometimes that's good, I think, because sometimes then it keeps, it lets, it forces you to um, let those new songs kind of ferment a little bit and make sure that that they're worthy, that you're not just, you know, ready to go in and record again simply because you're excited, but because you really got some quality work that you want to record you mm-hmm. know and what about uh, international distribution for this one Doug is um, you pretty much got everywhere covered um, well you know I'll have it stuff in, in the UK and, and throughout Europe and the States 
Um, I'm not sure about your island, <laughs> <laughs> your country, uh, but, uh, you know, some of that goes piece by piece, too. I mean, I've gotten uh, interest from other people already interested in broadening the licensing, and so you just kind of take that as it goes, you yeah. know. But then again, as you know, with the net and iTunes and everything else, there's well, a little right. bit of that global access. So, And, you know, the record's in all those outlets, so that's good, you know. All, all the digital outlets too and uh what's coming up for the rest of uh, 2008 for you well yeah i'll be doing some more gigs around uh probably around the south over the summer and then i go to like i said i know i go to england and the netherlands in the fall um, i don't know how much i'll expand beyond that um you know right now i'm getting things ready for like UK version of the record which is essentially the same but you still have to do all the particulars working with that um, so I want to keep gigging on that I want to hopefully finish this novel you know and uh, just just keep it moving that'll keep you busy well congratulations on this one it's a, it's a fantastic record I'm loving it and well, uh, thank you it's a great driving record I don't know whether anyone's yeah. mentioned that to you for sounds fantastic in the car on a long drive well well, that's cool. Well, I hope I get down to Australia and I can put it in and test it out, you know, <laughs> see if your theory is, is true. Plenty of open roads here. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Doug. Great to catch up with you again. Thanks so much. Thank and, you. And we'll stay in touch. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.